right, welcome everybody to the first in what's going to be a really valuable weekly series of video email newsletters where we're going to explore together the use and the value of history and philosophy when thinking about sports as a way to animate ourselves in the present to reach our full potential. Now, why use history and philosophy and how does that link to our full potential? Well, this is something that can't just be covered in one letter, one video, but something that in, involves a conversation between myself uh, and all of you who are going to be coming on this journey with me in order to, to aim ourselves uh, towards the best that we can possibly be. And as a, as a historian myself, uh, I always find inspiration in the past. It links us uh, to this incredible depth of meaning, this incredible stretch and expanse of experience um, that takes what we do in the present and gives it a little bit more depth, a little bit more heft, uh, and a little bit more value and a little bit more meaning. And when we think about the history of sport, oftentimes we're just thinking about records, you know, people who maybe performed in the last hundred years or so, um, the legends of the game, um, those kinds of things, but but most people don't realize that the value of athletics in a historical sense stretches back thousands and thousands of years, all the way back to the ancient Greeks who incorporated athletics, not just into a contemporary philosophy of individual improvement, but as something that they thought defined the excellence of their entire society and culture and differentiated them and actually elevated them um, above their neighbors, their contemporaries, the cultures and civilizations that they came into contact with. And so we're going to be hitting a number of different themes, sometimes once, sometimes returning to them, all in this exploration of the past and how we can use it to inspire us to be better today when it comes to our bodies, our minds, and our moral character. And I thought a great place to start would be accountability. <sighs> Now, we can think about accountability in a bunch of different ways, right? What is its definition? What does it mean to us when we're acting, uh, when we're acting and behaving in the world? We generally like to think about accountability as doing what you say you're going to do, right? Uh, as being consistent, as being reliable, as being dependable, right? But I think in an athletic sense, when we're thinking about uniting body and mind together in a moral endeavor and that's really kind of what the ancient greek thought athletics were all about i thought that we could adapt the idea of accountability a little bit and what i want you to think about when when thinking about accountability is this idea here right it's honoring your goals to the finish uh, even when the outcome is not what you expected right in sports Crossing the finish line is something that is that we all do, but how we cross the finish line is, it, it determines uh, and is and is variable, right? If you're someone who's been training hard to win that gold medal, but you finished across that line eighth place, right? Versus somebody who thought they were going to be eighth place, but somehow miraculously crosses first. There's one of those relationships which is a little bit easier to, to accept, right? If you have no expectation on your performance and you exceed those expectations, you're going to be pretty happy with yourself. But on the other end, you envisioned yourself triumphing or succeeding and things haven't gone your way. That's when accountability matters, right? It's very easy to fulfill your obligations when things are going well. But it's when things are really difficult and when things are really hard, that's when true accountability shines through. Because nobody really wants to measure themselves against the easiest times they've ever gone through. Like, what has that really proven to you? What has that shown that you are able to be depended on? Well, when, when things are easy, when there's no resistance, right, anybody can be a, anybody can be a, 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 a strong person to lean on. But what happens when things are difficult? What happens when the going gets hard? Do you still show that same resolve, that same dedication, that same 
honor to your goals, that even though you're not going to necessarily achieve them, it's sort of a, a respect to, to yourself that you see it through with effort, dedication, and humility, not so much embarrassment, right? And when we start to think about accountability like this, we begin to understand why athletics, right, this physical demonstration, this physical performance, this physical sacrifice that we take really helps us understand why and how we should be accountable. Now, I'm not going to try and dive too deeply into the past in these short videos. Um, if you're interested in the deep, nitty, gritty, specific details, I got an offer for you. Don't worry. Okay. Um, but the ancient Greeks conceived of athletics and why we celebrate and why we venerate the athlete is through their embrace of struggle, their embrace of sacrifice. And indeed, this is the very reason why the ancient Greeks revered the athlete. They found that their acceptance of, of struggle and sacrifice en route towards achievement was exemplary of the highest virtues in their society. And this comes directly out of Greek mythology, Greek religion. So athletics were intimately tied to Greek, to Greek athletics. They were performed in front of temples, right? The Olympics were held at the foot of Mount Olympus. This is where the ancient, uh, the Olympian gods sat. And they even had a patron saint of athletics uh, or a patron saint of the gymnasium, uh, the mythological figure of, of Hercules or, or Heracles. And there's this incredible moment in the story of Heracles, right? Heracles is the one who goes on the 12 physical labors. And then upon uh, completing them, he actually transcends his own mortality to sit amongst the gods. He becomes a demigod. But there's this moment in Heracles' life where he has to make a choice. He's about to enter into adulthood. So that transition from adolescence to adulthood, very, very symbolic transition in one's life. And he is given a choice. Two fairies appear to him, each representing virtue and vice, right? So vice tempts Heracles first to saying, if you follow me, I will give you all of the pleasures in life with none of the hardships, right? You will not want for anything. You will have unlimited pleasure and life will be easy for you. And you can see in this painting here um, that vice is represented uh, by the by the lady in the blue to uh, the blue to uh, the blue dress and the red tunic. Right. And she's pointing him up uh, towards pleasure. But vice or sorry, virtue, however, um, and she's represented uh, by the figure in the white. She tells Heracles that the road to greatness, the road to true value, the road to meaning, and the road that is set out for you, that is your destiny, is not the easy road, but it's the hard road in life. And this comes from uh, Xenophon. Xenophon is a, uh, a historian, uh, a Greek historian, an ancient Greek historian. And, and here he, he gives us a bit of the color of this exchange in Greek mythology, right? And this is, listen to how powerful these words from, from virtue are. Hercules, because I know your parents and have observed your disposition in the training uh, of your childhood, from which I entertain hopes that if you direct your steps along the path that leads to my dwelling, you will become an excellent performer of whatever is honorable and noble, and that I shall appear more honorable and distinguished in goodness. I will not deceive you, however, with promises of pleasure, but will set before you things as they really are, and as the gods have appointed them. For of what is valuable and excellent, the gods grant nothing to mankind without labor and care. So whatever it is that you aim for in your life, if you're not struggling towards it, and if it comes easy, then it's not truly meaningful, and it's not your true path towards de uh, it's not your true destined path especially the path that will lead you towards lead you towards greatness. And that gets me thinking about accountability. What do we owe to ourselves, right? When the when the tough gets going, do we shirk 
Do we run away? Do we seek the easy road? Or do we travel on down the road towards ultimate virtue? And the athlete is the one of the greatest representations of this accountability that we have. And this is one of the reasons why we celebrate the athlete. Because in their public performance, by competing against each other, they exemplify and demonstrate to us the necessity of sacrifice in order to achieve greatness. And when we see these moments in action, um, th they leave an incredible imprint on us. Now, I don't know how many of you know of the story of, of Derek Redmond and the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. I've included a video uh, from, from the IOC of this incredible event and I'll just describe it a little bit here but really if you haven't seen it and you don't know what I'm talking about you should really like pause this go and watch the video link that I've provided in the email and then come back because you'll be able to truly understand the value of what he what he's doing okay so Derek Redman is a highly rated um, uh, track athlete he's competing for the gold medal uh, in the 400 meter race and he's one of the favorites in the semifinal he pulls up lame in the middle of the race. He tears his hamstring and excruciatingly painful, right? And you just know it. He stops, he's down. But what does he do? In order to be accountable to himself and the goals that he set, right? Winning a gold medal. He doesn't walk off the track. He begins hobbling so that he can cross the finish line so that he is accountable to himself to finish what he started. And in an even more dramatic turn of events, Derek Redmond's father jumps onto the track. The officials attempt to push him away, to get him to go back to the crowd. He's not having any of that. He is helping his son achieve the goal that he set out, not in the way that he dreamed of, not crossing the finish line and being crowned gold medalist, but crossing the finish line in a way that respects the sacrifices he's made to get there, honors the fact that he can finish he has the ability to finish and that is more important in being accountable to himself than in necessarily winning the gold medal and to give you an example of why this accountability is celebrated does anybody know off the top of their head who won the 400 meter race in the 1992 barcelona olympics is this a name that we echo throughout history as someone who exemplifies the greatest qualities of an athlete, someone we would want to model ourselves after, or a moment of inspiration? No, nobody knows. We don't remember who that was. We don't know who that is. But everybody remembers Derek Redman. And why is that? Because he exemplified the accountability we desire out of our athletes, right? That no matter what happens to them along the way, through good, through bad, in victory or defeat, they cross the finish line with humility and grace and dignity. And this is a direct line from the ancient Greeks and their philosophy on what athletics meant and did in their society to what we want it to do. And oftentimes in contemporary society, we're not living up to those ideals. And we like to think that, uh, and we joke about this sometimes, right, that sport can be a matter of life and death for some people and that they should step back and not take it so seriously. Uh, but the ancient Greeks, they didn't have that idea. Uh, they took it about as seriously as life or death. And one of the most incredible examples of this is the story of our Hishin. And when we think about accountability in action and what Derek Redmond showed to us, he's really just trans translating and transmitting these ancient ideas. Okay. So our Hishin is a three time Pancration winner at the ancient Olympics. All right. So he's at the uh, 54th Olympiad in 564 BCE. He's won two Pancration titles before he's going for the third one. All right. He's made it to the finals. His goal, his destiny is to be an undefeated champion at Olympia. And, and this is a tremendous amount of, of prestige and pride, not just for our Hishin, but for the city-state that he comes from. But he's in a bad way, okay? And for those of you who don't know what Pancration is, think about it as ancient Greek uh, mixed martial arts, arts. There's only two rules in Pancration. No biting, no eye gouging. Everything else is cool. 
All right, so our Hishin's in a bit of trouble. He's being strangled by his opponent, right? He's about to he's about to give up. He's about to tap out because, you know, it's either that or 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 don't breathe anymore, essentially. These are his two options. Out of the crowd, his trainer shouts to him, okay? And here we get a sense from Philostratus what's going on, right? Philostratus is an ancient chronicler, so let's go to him to get some of the sense of this drama. What happens? When Arhishan, the Pancratian, Pancratiast, who had won already two Olympic Games and after this fought in the third Olympiad in the finals, already thought about submitting, his trainer, Arixias, brought him to despise death by shouting from the outside the ring. What a wonderful funeral speech, if one can say. He did not give up at Olympia. So Arhishan desires greatness and accountability to himself more so than his own life. Before he dies in the ring, he's strangled to death. He grabs the toe of his opponent, breaks it. The opponent screams in horrifying pain and gives up. Arhishan dies at the same moment. The Greeks in, who are in the crowd are now faced with this difficult choice. Who is the winner? The person who tapped out but is still alive or the person who didn't quit but is dead? They pick up the corpse of Arhishan put him on their shoulders, put the olive laurel around his head and proclaim Arhishin the corpse as champion. And to give you a sense of what they thought about the guy who tapped out, who was not accountable to that extra little bit necessary to win, the ancient Greeks didn't even bother recording his name. We don't even know who this person was. We don't need to know. They weren't accountable to the necessary qualities it takes to become a champion. And sometimes that's victory, as we see with Arhishan. Other times, it's fidelity to the dignity of the athlete, like with Derek Redman. So as we wrap up this first of, again, what's going to become a continuous series of these weekly email letters where we dive into some old stories and some neat concepts that are going to help each of us, right, become better in our own lives, in our physical capacity, in our intellectual capacity, and in our, where's the, where's the, where's it going? Uh, three, yeah, uh, moral capacity as well. It's like a mirror, right? You move one way and it goes the opposite direction. I'll get it one day. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> so what what does this mean? What what does it mean? It means that accountability matters when things are bad. It doesn't matter so much when things are going well because anybody anybody can show up when things are easy. The value of athletics is it trains us in these moments of discomfort, in these moments of pain in these moments of adversity and sometimes we don't get through it right when it comes to Derek Redman what a tragic story but it's not so much the moment it's what our accountability says about our character in that moment and what we want to think about is not how do I prepare myself to become accountable in one specific moment in one specific instance but how do I live my life in a way that I can depend upon myself that in those difficult situations, I'm not going to shy away from the necessary responsibility, the necessary sacrifice that is necessary uh, of me. And if we want to think about ways to become more accountable, then we have to exemplify that in our day-to-day -day lives. And what better way to become accountable to yourself than through physical activity, right? You are accountable to showing up on time. You're accountable for putting in the work, right? Of putting in literally the sweat labor in order to get the results. On days you feel like, like you can't do it, you're stuck in mud, you show up and you go through the motions. On days where you feel full of life, you achieve and you excel. But it doesn't matter what you feel like. You're accountable just by showing up on the good and on the bad days. And if you want some more interesting information about why the Greeks thought this was such a valuable activity for to hold oneself to account and how it's related specifically to ideas of moral virtue of famous philosophers like Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato, 
uh, famous poets and literary figures in the ancient Greek world like Pindar and Homer, right? Homer, the one who wrote uh, the Iliad uh, and the Odyssey, and even why it's tied into religious figures like Heracles and Zeus, for example, uh, then I, 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 I highly think, uh, I, I think that uh, the book that I've written and that I'm basing a lot of these um, lectures on, The Athletic Hero, is a great place for you to dive further. Um, so definitely, if you've taken a look at that sa sample chapter I've given you uh, and you want to learn more, it's a great chance for you uh, today uh, to pick that up. So thanks.